So today I will talk about developing spectrally efficient photonic systems using optical frequency cones, with a focus on both optical and wireless transmission systems. Uh, this work has been carried out at the Radio and Optical Communications Group in Dublin City University, Ireland. Obviously the internet as we know it today is enabled by photonics, and the internet underpins the massive ICT industry worldwide. But the internet is currently under strain due to the massive growth in traffic over the last two decades. So we need to develop new technology solutions to enhance the spectral efficiency of the optical networks that form the internet. It's interesting to look at communications before photonics and fiber optics to understand the importance of information transfer to society. And for this, I'm going to use the communication link between Europe and North America. If you go back to the 1850s and we want to send information between Europe and North America, this would typically take a few weeks, the time it takes for a boat to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. In 1858, the very first transatlantic telegraph cable was laid between the west coast of Ireland and Newfoundland. And this greatly reduced the time it took to send information from Europe to North America, down to a few hours. If you look at newspapers in the time, you can read how the world could suddenly read closing quotations from Wall Street on the same day. This was revolutionary from a communications perspective. However, it was not cheap, and to send the equivalent of a tweet over this first transatlantic telegraph cable would cost about 10,000 euro. In 1927, this link between Europe and North America became a radio-based telephone service, and in 1956, the very first transatlantic telephone cable could carry 36 telephone calls. In the 1960s and 1970s, we developed our key optical and photonic technologies. And these resulted in the very first transatlantic fiber optic cable, which would carry 40,000 calls or 280 megabits per second. Skip forward to today and Google are currently installing a 250 terabit per second optical fiber link between Europe and North America. So optical fibers now form the backbone of the internet. And these optical fibers crisscross all of the oceans and continents on this planet. This figure shows the growth in available download speeds. And this is the data rate which is available to you in your home, either on your computer or using your mobile phone. Some of us will remember dial-up modems back in the early 90s when we could achieve just tens of kilobits per second. Nowadays, we can achieve tens of megabits and in some cases of hundreds of megabits per second at home. This growth in access rates has been driving the requirement for much higher speed in the core optical networks. And these core fiber networks are based on wavelength division multiplexing technology. We obviously want these download speeds that are available at home to increase over the coming decade. And the two main scalable broadband access solutions are fiber to the home and moving to beyond 5G technologies where we use very high frequency RF carriers to achieve very high capacity data transmission. For wavelength division multiplexing, we are basically looking at sending multiple wavelength channels or colors down a single fiber. The initial WDM systems used on-off signaling. This means that when the light was on, we were sending a digital one, and when the light is off, we send a digital zero. Current systems now use both phase and amplitude modulation, to improve the spectral efficiency and capacity of these WDM systems. This graph here shows the evolution of WDM systems over the last 40 years. The very first WDM systems could send 155 megabits over a single fiber, and they just use one single wavelength. As the decades pass by, we move to increasing both the data rate per wavelength and the number of wavelengths on a single fiber. And nowadays we can send about 160 wavelengths on a single fiber with 200 gigabits per second on each wavelength. We should note that the average download speeds, i.e. the access rates that are available to us at home, are orders of magnitude slower than this core capacity. But the growth in the data rates in the core network correspond with the growth in the data rates that are available to us at home. So these optical fibers are now becoming full from the spectral capacity. One good figure of merit here is the spectral efficiency. And you can see how this has increased dramatically over the last decades, where we have now reached a situation where the optical fibers are almost full. So how we have increased the data rate on these optical fibers over the last number of years is in conjunction with wavelength division multiplexing, 
we're using advanced modulation form and transmission on each wavelength channel. This means that we can send more than one bit per symbol and we can improve the spectral efficiency. So initial systems, like I said, could just achieve one bit per symbol using simple on-off keying or binary phase shift keying. Nowadays, we are using QPSK, 8QAM, and 16QAM on these WDM transmission systems. 16QAM achieves four, bit per, four bits per symbol. So using the two polarizations of light and operating at a baud rate of 25 gigabaud gives us 200 gigabit per second on a single wavelength. If you consider how can we now increase the capacity and spectral efficiency of these WDM systems, one technology is to move towards what's called super channel transmission. The idea of super channels is that we remove the guard band that's placed between these wavelength vision multiplex channels. The guard band is there because these WDM signals are generated from independent laser sources. And these independent laser sources tend to drift relative to one another. So that means we need to place a spectral separation between the WVM channels. If we can remove that spacing, we can free up some optical spectrum, and that free optical spectrum can now be used to send more information. However, to do this, we need to ensure that we are using optical sources which are very stable relative to one another to develop these WVM super channel transmission systems. So imagine we want to develop a one terabit per second transmission system. We could start off with 10 100 gigabit per second line cards, but this tends to be a very bulky solution and does not scale operation. What we would like to achieve is a single line card which can generate the 10 wavelength channels we need to transmit the one terabit per second signal. And this is known as a super channel. The main difference between a super channel and conventional wavelength division multiplexing is the channel separation. To achieve this channel separation, which is essentially zero, we need to move from using independent laser sources to using optical frequency combs as the sources in these super channel transmission systems. So how can we generate these optical frequency combs? Obviously, the key parameter of this frequency comb is that we need to have a fixed frequency spacing between the comb lines. This ensures that there is no interference between the wavelength division multiplex channels. So there are four main techniques to generate optical frequency combs. We can use external modulators, we can use modal lasers, we can use curve frequency combs, or we can use gain switching of a laser diode. What all of these techniques have in common is that they develop and generate an optical frequency comb. And in this optical frequency comb, the periodicity applies not only to the envelopes of the optical pulses that are generated, but to the whole electric field of the optical pulses, including the optical phase. So for the optical frequency comb in the time domain, we need to have optical pulses where there is coherence between the optical pulses generated. So let's go through these four techniques. This shows the experimental setup for generation of an optical frequency comb using external modulators. In this case, we're using two max sender modulators in series, and they are both driven with RF signals coming from a signal generator and electrical amplifiers. By changing the relative phase shift between the two signals applied, we can generate a very flat optical frequency comb as presented here. The second technique is to use a mode lock laser. There are different mode lock laser techniques that can be used to generate optical frequency combs. In this slide, I'm just presenting one known as a quantum dash mode lock laser. This is a single section laser. And you can read more about the operation of this device in these papers. By changing the length of this cavity, we can change the number of optical modes generated and the separation between the comb lines are the free spectral range. We can also use care frequency microresonator combs. In this technology, the interaction between a CW pump laser and modes of a high Q microresonator via the care nonlinearity generate the optical frequency comb as presented in this figure. The broadband nature of the parametric gain can result in frequency combs which can span up to almost 500 nanometers. And you can read more about this technique in this nature paper from 2007. 
In the laboratory in Dublin City University, we use a technique known as gain switching. With gain switching, we apply a, a high power RF signal directly to the gain section of a slave laser. We also inject light from a master laser into this slave laser. The high power RF signal drives the slave laser above and below threshold, generating a train of optical pulses. And this corresponds to an optical frequency comb in the frequency domain. The injection from the master laser into the slave laser reduces both the phase noise and the intensity noise of the optical comb lines generated. And this is important for ensuring the fidelity of the QPSK or 16 qua modulation, which we encode onto these optical comb lines in a super channel transmission system. We can also change the frequency applied to the laser to change the free spectral range or spacing between the comb lines. So this shows the experimental setup we've used to demonstrate the performance of this gain switch frequency comb in a flexible terabit per second WDM super channel system. So the comb lines are modulated with either QPSK or 16 QAM information and transmitted over varying lengths of fiber before going into our coherent receiver to look at the performance of the individual lines in the super channel system. You can read more about this work at this paper. The main experimental results are shown on this slide. Uh, we are using an optical frequency comb with a channel spacing of 18.5 gigahertz, and we're using a baud rate of 18 gigabaud. We use both dual polarization QPSK and dual polarization 16 QAM in these experiments. You can see the constellation diagrams here for the received polarizations for both QPSK and 16 QAM. For QPSK, we achieve performance well below the 7% FEC limit for transmission over up to 300 kilometers of fiber for all of the channels in our super channel system. Using 16 QAM, we can achieve performance just about below the 7% FEC limit for transmission over 150 kilometers. Obviously, when we go to a higher order modulation format, we need to have a better signal to noise ratio to achieve good performance. But using this gain switch comb source, we've achieved spectral efficiencies approaching eight bits per second per hertz, and we can achieve a flexible sub-channel spacing and modulation format. We are currently working on developing an integrated gain switch comb source, which can be used in practical systems, both in core, metro, access, and data center networks. In this integrated chip, we have both the slave laser and the master laser all on the same photonic integrated circuit. And current characterization shows how we can achieve combs with free spectral ranges varying from 7 to 10 gigahertz. And we are currently looking at increasing the free spectral range up to 25 to 30 gigahertz. So we can also use optical frequency combs for enabling very high capacity 5G and beyond 5G networks. If we think about 5G networks, essentially we're looking currently at using frequency in the range from about 3.4 to 4 gigahertz. But future 5G networks will look at using much higher RF carrier frequencies. And this is because we can send more information at these higher RF carrier frequencies. And we can use fiber and photonics for both the distribution and generation of these high frequency signals for future high capacity 5G networks. So how can we use optical fiber for distribution of these 5G signals? Well, as we move towards optical fiber access networks, we will have fibers going to people's homes. We can also use these fibers for the distribution of the 5G signals. So the passive optical network infrastructure in the future can be used not just for transmission of wired signals to people's homes, but also for wireless signals that can be distributed. In terms of the distribution of these 5G signals over fiber, there are two technologies that can be used. One is digital and one is analog. In digital radio over fiber, we digitize the radio signal to be transmitted before transmitting it over the optical fiber infrastructure. This is typically known as SIPRI. In this technology, the required bandwidth can be 10 times the wireless transport data rate. 
So this can make this digital radio or fiber solution quite inefficient from a bandwidth perspective. In analog radio or fiber, we send the radio signal in its native format over the optical fiber. So we transmit an analog wireless signal over fiber. This avoids digitization processes at the remote radio head and reduces the complexity of the remote radio head. As we can see here, using analog radio or fiber, we do not need to have any digital to analog converter or analog to digital converter in the remote radio head. So how can we use optical frequency combs for the distribution and generation of RF carriers that can be used for future 5G systems? So here we show an optical frequency comb which can generate light on multiple colors or multiple wavelengths. By using a frequency or wavelength selective element, we can pick out two wavelengths or carriers from this optical frequency comb. We can then modulate one of these optical lines with the mobile data or RF information signal that we want to transmit over the air. These two optical lines can then be passed onto a photodiode and when they beat on a photodiode, we will generate an RF signal at a frequency corresponding to the separation between the two optical lines, one which is unmodulated and one which is modulated carrying the RF information of interest. Note using this technology, we can generate millimeter wave frequencies at frequencies anywhere from 28 gigahertz up to 90 gigahertz and indeed beyond. So we can then implement the distribution of these signals in the optical access infrastructure. This technique is known as optical heterodyning, where the beating of two optical components spaced by the desired millimeter wave frequency on the photodiode generates the RF signal that we require. When generating RF signals using heterodyning, it's important to understand the advantage of using an optical frequency cone. In this slide, I'm showing what will happen if we use two independent laser sources and beat them together to generate an RF signal. The issue here is that the phase noise on the RF signal generated is determined by the phase noise and the addition of the phase noise on the independent laser sources. So to achieve successful transmission of 5G information signals using orthogonal frequency division multiplexing transmission, we would need to have very low line width optical carriers. So if we want to achieve OFDM transmission using two megabaud RF subcarriers, then we would need to have optical sources with line widths in the order of 30 kilohertz. If we want to have OFDM transmission with 200 kilobaud subcarriers, and I should say that these are the subcarrier rates that are being standardized for 5G systems, then we need to have optical carriers with three kilohertz line width, which is very challenging from an optical perspective. However, if we use optical frequency cones, because we are using correlated lines, as in the optical lines have correlated phase noise, when these lines beat together, we achieve very low phase noise RF signals. And these low phase noise RF signals can support very high order modulation formats on the millimeter waves. So that's why optical frequency combs are a key technology for both the distribution and generation of 5G signals at high frequency RF carriers. So this shows an experiment that we have implemented in the laboratory in DCU to investigate the transmission of 5G information signals using an optical infrastructure. We use an optical frequency comb to generate multiple comb lines, and we select two of these. One line is modulated with the 5G information signal, and the other line is unmodulated. After combining these two optical signals, they are transmitted over our optical fiber infrastructure to the photodiode, where the unmodulated and the modulated carrier beat on the photodiode to generate the 5G signal of interest, in this case at 57.8 gigahertz. In this experiment, we then mix this signal back down and sample it on a real-time scope to look at the performance uh, of this system. In a, a real practical system, this RF signal will be transmitted over air using an antenna. 
In this experiment, we are looking at using a, a novel type of modulation format that could be used in 5G. Currently, most 5G systems are using standard orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. However, by using universally filtered orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, we can reduce the out of band emission. And this means that we can place more of these channels close together to achieve higher spectral efficiency in these future 5G systems. So here we're showing the result using the experimental setup on the previous slide, where we now have five UF OFDM channels, and we're using 64 QAM modulation on all of the RF subcarriers. We are using 312 subcarriers in each channel, and the total bandwidth of the signal is 152 megahertz. So the subcarrier baud rate is around 2 megabaud. This means that we have about 0.9 gigabits per second in each channel, and a total data rate of 4.5 gigabits per second. Here we show the error vector magnitude across all of the RF subcarriers for channel 2, and you can see we are below 5% for most subcarriers. This shows the received constellation showing the excellent performance of this system. We can even move to higher order modulation formats on the RF subcarriers. In this case, we achieve 256 QAM, which is getting a data rate of 1.22 gigabit per second on a single channel. You can see here the error vector magnitude is in the order of 3%, and here we show the received constellation of the 256 QAM signal. I should note here that to achieve 256 QAM modulation on a subcarrier with about 2 megabaud, uh, we would need to have a very low RF carrier phase noise. Very low phase noise on the RF carrier. And this is only achieved in our optical system due to the fact that we are using an optical frequency pump. If we look at the standard for 5G, as I explained earlier, we actually need to be using subcarrier spacings in the order of hundreds of kilohertz and not two megabaud as used in the previous experiment. So we have recently altered our experiment and we are now looking at the performance of a 5G UF OFDM transmission system where we are using subcarrier spacings of 125 kilohertz and using our gain switched comb source where we use the external injection to improve both the phase noise and the intensity noise, we can now achieve EVM performance of around 7% uh, using this optical frequency comb for 5G generation at 60 gigahertz. Remember, this is only achieved because the gain switch comb source is using correlated comb lines. So when they beat together, we get RF line widths, which are sub kilohertz and then can support these higher order modulation formats on very low baud rate uh, OFDM signals. So to conclude, the continuing growth in demand is placing a massive strain on the internet, both on the optical infrastructure and the wireless infrastructure. So we need to develop technologies which enhance the spectral efficiency of these optical networks and the wireless networks. I presented how optical comb sources can be used to develop super channel systems in which we can improve the spectral efficiency because there is no need for a guard band between the WDM channels. These optical comb sources can also reduce the power consumption in optical networks because we only need a, sim a single thermoelectric cooler in order to cool the lasers. We're also developing an integrated comb source which can reduce the footprint and make these comb sources into practical transceivers for future networks, both core networks, metropolitan networks, access networks, and indeed metropolitan networks. I've also presented how optical frequency combs can be used to enable optical distribution of very high speed wireless signals. And specifically, I presented how gain switch comb sources can be used for spectrally efficient systems operating at 60 gigahertz. The key point of using optical frequency combs here is that because we're using correlated lines and we use the heterodyning technique to generate the RF signal, we can generate very low line width RF signals which are very stable. And this enables us to successfully transmit 5G signals over the fiber network 
using very high order modulation formats and the low subcarrier spacings which are required for 5G networks. So I would like to acknowledge the work of the Radio Nautical Communications Lab in DCU, IEEE Photonics Society, and the various funding agencies in Ireland, specifically Science Foundation Ireland, the Higher Education Institute, and Connect and IPIC research centers. Thank you.